Does everybody hear? Okay, well, there'll be some there'll be some people still trying to get in. I better just check. But um, if you if you want to kick off, uh, that's that's fine. Obviously, uh, hopefully, the people out there uh, can't tell from from uh, from here. Obviously, it's not like being in a room together. Uh, welcome to the TUCG event, obviously, that we would normally be holding uh, at conference. Um, but obviously, as the way the world is now, we're, we're meeting by Zoom. And if, like me, you'd prefer Zooms to be a nice lolly, um, you know, and can't wait for them to return to being a nice lolly uh, so we can all meet in person. Um, I think what we're looking at um, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a time when we can all come come together in, in some way or other though uh, and hopefully still still discuss the, the, the issues that we are faced with uh, today and obviously tonight the TUCG uh, is holding this meeting um, on, the, on the, with the hope of, of answering some of the issues and, and some of the questions that, that you have uh, and probably would have liked to have raised at, at the Labour Party. Um, the TUCG is, is a made up of 10 different trade unions um, and tonight we've got some great speakers, as always, at the TUCG uh, Fringe event as we meet in. Uh, obviously, we're recognising that uh, we are now in a crisis, uh, which is probably going to create uh, an awful lot um, of unemployment. Uh, with the ending of the uh, rent evictions, it's probably going to create a lot of homelessness. And of course, you know, we, we seem to be lacking in political leadership. Um, which obviously means that the country seems to be uh, going from one crisis to another. I'm taking over the chair uh, tonight, so, so as well as, as, as uh, obviously going to introduce myself, I'm Ian Hodson, who's the National President of the Baker's Food and Live Workers Union. Um, obviously, I will, I will say a quick few words uh, before I bring in uh, the, the speakers tonight. We're going to have, obviously, the trade union speakers and some political speakers um, and, and obviously, hopefully, cover, like I say, the issues that, that um, are, are, are what you are uh, concerning yourself with at this moment in time. Okay. Okay, we are, we are facing a crisis. Uh, some say it will be bad as, as the 1930s unemployment, homelessness, child poverty, a society in crisis. Uh, led by politicians who seem unable uh, to take us in any, in any direction uh, or show any leadership. In fact, deliberately sending out mixed messages uh, to do what Tories have always done, uh, divide and rule, uh, blaming different sections of the community. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, when the crisis started, it was the old. Uh, then, then obviously, during, during the, uh, the reopening of the economy, they started blaming the Muslims, now currently uh, they're blaming the young. But it would appear that if you've uh, seen the minutes from the SAGE report that was, that was released uh, from August, uh, where the government continuously said that it was following the science, it clearly wasn't. And it clearly looks now that when the government said it was planning for this crisis, it was actually planning for a flu epidemic, uh, not a COVID pandemic. Of course, they took us into this lockdown too late. Uh, they brought us out of it too early. Um, and obviously the Tories, as always, seem to have made the decisions based on their political interest and, and not that of the people. As, a, as someone who obviously uh, represents the food workers, uh, we, we managed to work the majority of, of this uh, pandemic and most of, most of our workplaces seemed quite secure. Uh, but as we moved from two metres to one, what we've seen is, is a rise in, in cases in the food industry. As we witnessed the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, it's appeared to have had a devastating effect um, on, on British, British uh, companies like Greg's, uh, while yet we've used taxpayers' money to, to fund American global corporations like McDonald's. And that could see you know, a significant impact on a decent employer uh, who this week unfortunately announced uh, that it intends to make a number of people redundant. But also alongside this, we've, we've got a situation where obviously the government has announced uh, new plans to, to find people uh, who test positive um, if, they, if they go outside the house. 
um, which obviously means an awful lot of low paid workers uh, are gonna fall, be thrown into deeper poverty than, than they already have. Uh, it means that many, many workers will make a decision on whether or not they should go and test themselves because clearly if they don't know, um, then they can't be fined. Um, it would also mean that, you know, trying, trying to survive on statutory sick pay, a decision which too many, I think it's two million people um, have to face, um, will, would, would mean that they wouldn't be able to afford to eat and pay the rent. Um, and that's why obviously we've just recently joined and, and started a campaign with Don't Leave Organise uh, to end the paltry statutory sick pay and introduce a real sick income. Uh, that would create uh, people uh, being able to receive six weeks sick pay linked to their normal weekly wage. If you're a zero hours worker, it would be based on an average of your last 12 weeks earnings. And, so, and of course, the same for the self-employed. After six weeks, it would mean that the benefit that you would go on would be linked to a, another benefit that, that would offer a, an income of at least 80% uh, equivalent um, of, of the average wage. Obviously that, that would be funded, um, the six weeks pay would be funded by uh, employers because uh, we would be asking the, the government to levy employers uh, in the case of um, trying to level the playing field. Uh, we believe it's a pro-business um, way of doing it on the basis that what it would mean is that employers uh, who don't currently pay company sick pay but get an advantage when it comes to uh, competing um, in the marketplace against companies uh, who do recognise the need to, to, to uh, treat their workers fairly, um, would lose that competitive advantage because obviously they would have to make sure that they provided decent employment terms and conditions uh, for their workers uh, like those companies who currently do. Uh, and it would mean that people wouldn't have to make a choice on whether or not um, to, to take the decision to isolate or to take uh, that decision to go into work for, for fear of falling into poverty or fear of, even worse with the raising of the, um, of the situation in relation to the evictions bans being lifted tomorrow, uh, homelessness too. So obviously today, uh, we're going to be covering all of those areas and obviously we're now looking forward to inviting um, Sean Jones, who's the National Union of Journalists, uh, to make a contribution. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Ian. Um, hi, everybody. Um, we were saying before we started how strange it is, and um, I like Zoom ice lolly lollies as well, Ian, but we were you know, saying it would have been wonderful to all be together and have... Um, solidarity in person and be um, together at conference but obviously uh, that's not possible this year so um, Zoom it is. Um, so as Ian said my name's Sean Jones, I'm the president of the National Union of Journalists, um, we're a proud member of the TUCG, I'm very happy to speak um, at, at today's fringe meeting um, and uh, I, I'd just like to sort of run through a little bit about how coronavirus has affected the media industry um, uh, we, we represent people um, in the UK and Ireland. Um, in a re anybody who's a media professional in the UK and Ireland is eligible for NUJ membership. Um, and the media industry has undoubtedly been affected by by, by the pandemic. Um, in some ways, it simply accelerated what was already happening. Um, in the industry so we've seen smaller titles going to the wall we've seen job losses um, but of course on top of that we've also seen pay cuts uh, even big agencies like the press association for example um, got its staff to take what was described as a voluntary pay cut um, at the at, at the outset of the pandemic it wasn't it wasn't really uh, voluntary i don't think you would have been sticking around very long if you didn't take that pay cut um, and uh, we've seen huge numbers of content providers um, furloughed for example, if you worked in sports journalism, sports news, there just wasn't anything to be um, 
to be covering once lockdown hit. Um, so lots of people were furloughed or just, um, and the, the really big one for us has been freelancers and there's huge numbers of people working in the media industry who are freelancers who've fallen foul of the Treasury's rules around the self-employment um, um, income uh, um, uh, able to claim those payments uh, so we've launched a, a campaign called forgotten freelancers um, uh, people just lost their commissions overnight even people who were regular casuals were uh, who could have been furloughed by their um, uh, commissioning uh, companies they, they didn't do that so lots of people have have gone from having very healthy um, incomes regular work as freelancers to losing all of that work and not being able to claim any compensation um, through things like the furlough scheme which didn't apply to self-employed workers uh, so that's been a huge issue um, myself I work in a, in a in a press office and I just noticed straight off um, those early weeks the number of out offices we were getting back uh, with people saying they've been furloughed um, and then people saying that they've left those titles so and that's just a little kind of insight to what's happening in terms of jobs um, across the media industry yet at this time especially at the outset of the pandemic the public desire for news coverage in particular um, really increased it massively increased um, during lockdown um, and before that news programs news output was really losing audience numbers it had been a long-term trend where those kind of viewing figures of things like the bbc six o'clock ten o'clock news itv ten o'clock news channel four news had been on a downward trajectory but during lockdown that completely reversed um, so according to the uh, most recent Ofcom report on um, viewing figures which is called Media Nations 2020 it was published at the beginning of August and that showed that the average daily consumption of what they described as audiovisual content increased by an hour and a half per person per day to six hours and 25 minutes every day we were sat watching uh, and that included on-demand services uh, but broadcast TV was a really big part of that and in terms of the broadcast section of that news consumption um, uh, accounted for virtually all of the increase so people were literally tuning in to find out what was going on um, and that was that was things like you know BBC News but do you remember those press conferences that were being sort of live streamed from uh, 10 Downing Street with health experts, Boris Johnson, Dominic Raab for a little bit when Johnson was um, hospitalised. So that really kind of accounted for that spike in people tuning in to news. It completely reversed the trend in the drop in news consumption. Um, and public service broadcasting got a real boost. Um, so that, fir that first week of lockdown, um, according to Ofcom again, same, same report, BBC services were used by 82% of the population, so more than 8 out of 10 people were tuning into the BBC in some form to get information and news, it's just talking about news, not talking about um, ent um, entertainment, uh, strictly anything like that, this is purely the news content that they were wanting at that time, and rightly so, and all public service broadcasters, BBC, ITV and Channel 4 News got a real boost um, in terms of viewing figures, but they also um, were uh, uh, were described and rated as trusted sources by eight out of ten people, um, which is really important when you think about the amount of fake news that's going around at the moment. But of course, these public service broadcasters and news generation news content. Um, has been um, underfunded and has seen cuts to its funding for a number of years. So um, at the NUJ, what we did, so, so this, this brings me to I totally echo everything Ian has said um, earlier about the, the, the threats to wider society. So in terms of stepping up the opposition to all of that, just again, looking at our own industry, the NUJ launched something called 
the news recovery plan. Um, it's an excellent document. We got it out fairly early doors. Um, it's available on the NUJ website, which is nuj.org.uk. It's there on the homepage. Government's been quite interested in it. We've been using it as an active campaigning document. And I just wanted to give you some of the measures that we've put in there because they're really practical measures, a lot of them, um, that we think could and should be taken by the government and would really like Labour to be calling for them. We, we actually really want cross-party support for all of these and we've, we've been getting a lot of traction um, in certain areas. So, for example, um, the NUJ uh, is calling for a windfall tax of 6%. Um, on the big tech giants, so Facebook, Google's, you know, th these companies have had a very good lockdown. They've been they've been taking in huge amounts of money, um, while other parts of the industry have really been suffering. So a six percent windfall tax on those tech giants, um, uh, going towards um, another, to, to fund the measures that we outline. So we also want to see things like. Um, jobs for journalists and tax credits for journalists and interest-free loans um, targeted uh, at two-year pro uh, programme for frontline journalistic news roles. That's where there's a real deficit in frontline news gathering jobs. Um, the NUJ is saying that there should be no public money for firms who are making redundancies, cutting pay, curtailing frontline journalistic roles, taking executive bonuses at this time, and obviously crucially for everyone involved in this fringe meeting, blocking trade union organisation. Public funds should not go to organisations that, that you know, are union busters. Um, we, uh, we also want to see those companies, anybody receiving public money to um, be prohibited from any mergers, cuts, closures while they're in receipt of public money. Um, and we want to see strategic investment in government advertising. So, so advertising can really be the lifeline for a lot of smaller local regional titles, in particular newspapers. So uh, with strategic investment in government advertising there, including the NHS and the health and safety um, executive, and also a financial support package for innovative public interest journalism. And we want to see free vouchers for online or print subscriptions for all 18 and 19 year olds. So we want people to be consuming news and we want to see tax breaks for on, on things like subscriptions and sort of more longer term, some of the things that we've been calling for um, is having a rollout of um, nationwide media literacy campaigns, absolutely crucial to combating fake news. Um, so, um, as I say, th this, this document is, is only eight pages long, but it's stuffed full of really great practical information, ideas, um, the kind of opposition that we want to see to, um, you know, we, we absolutely say you cannot have the status quo. This is not about propping up the kind of Murdochs of this world. Um, it's about having quality journalism, news journalism from a national to a, to a hyper-local level. And uh, without that crucial frontline news gathering, there is a massive democratic deficit. So without those journalists, without those news gatherers, you're not being able to hold this government to account. You're not able to expose those frontline stories of what's happening in A&E in your local hospital. You're not able to tell those stories in a compelling, trustworthy way. So that's why it's so important to invest in frontline news jobs. So I would recommend that you go to the NUJ website, have a look at this. There's also a petition you can sign. Um, so I've, I've, I've probably could done more than my five minutes there, but thank you very much, Chair. Very much, Sean, and I think that was valuable uh, contribution. And obviously, I think the the, uh, the suggestions you're putting forward are are, are, are realistic and, and achievable. I mean, obviously, uh, I'm sure I'm sure obviously the the politicians will listen, listening very carefully, and um, we're we'll taking those on board. Um, it's a great pleasure now that obviously we get to invite Steve Gillen um, to 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 address to address this Zoom meeting. Cheers, Steve. Ian, um, thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. You can hear me, that's excellent. Um, PLA have always been um, active within the TUCG. I think we've been there since its, since its inception as one of the leading trade unions uh, when the TUCG was founded. Uh, very proud of the history of it. Um, I don't think anybody really could have foreseen 
this global pandemic. Um, and I, I do get troubled when you see people that um, in this country, particularly on social media, try and rubbish that in actual fact there is a pandemic and that it's not serious and so forth. Well, the figures speak for themselves. When you get 30 million people worldwide that's had uh, COVID-19 and has been uh, just short of a million deaths and rising, I think it just goes to show you how serious this is. Um, and I've got to say, uh, as, as a trade unionist, um, particularly where uh, I represent uh, in the prison service and uh, special hospitals, um, early doors when the lockdown came, which I agree with Ian was far too late actually, it should have been a lot sooner. Um, the modelling uh, was that it was going to be catastrophic potentially within the prison uh, environment because of the closed environment and they were talking about between potentially 3,000 and 4,000 deaths. Um, that was quite frightening because there's no manual for this. You can't just open a manual at page 56 uh, and it tells you what to do. Um, and I'm pleased to say that my trade union actually for the first time uh, in probably about 25 years was seen as part of the solution and not the problem. And I say that sincerely because um, government and employers, uh, including in the private sector, listened uh, to what we had to say. And I've got to say they implemented what we had to say, uh, say as well, so that there was plenty of safeguards there for staff and those in our care. Sadly, um, there were still deaths and uh, we're not out the woods yet. Um, staff members have died uh, and prisoners have died, but nowhere near the catastrophic numbers uh, that we've seen uh, globally uh, and indeed in this country when we talk about you know, as high as 50 to 60,000. Um, you look at the, I want to talk a little bit just not about prison officers and, and my members because when you actually look at what people always looked at, low skilled workers, as far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing as low skilled workers. Every worker is equally as important as the next worker. And the sooner that we control that narrative, the better, because the cleaners in the hospitals our care workers, our shop workers, our bus drivers, uh, nurses, doctors, uh, prison officers, firefighters, um, everybody has been doing their bit uh, to keep this country going. Uh, unfortunately, the government haven't kept uh, this country going. It's been those key workers and some of them uh, deserve that recognition. And I'm afraid it doesn't always happen. And, and I think organising for the future, um, Essentially, I, I, I think what we need is effective opposition. And I don't just mean from the Labour Party, I think there needs to be effective opposition from the trade union movement per se. Um, the problem is uh, that we have at the moment is a situation with the anti-trade union laws where it doesn't, it's got a strangulation on most trade unions. In fact, my union only knows it too well about that strangulation because we aren't allowed to take any form of legitimate industrial action and even when we do take action on legitimate health and safety issues employer and the government deem that to be uh, industrial action and they run us into court and unfortunately uh, we were on the receiving end uh, of uh, just before the pandemic of a contempt of court um, and we were found guilty of contempt of court because we had a national walkout on health and safety uh, and we had reason uh, for Liverpool to walk out as well and I as General Secretary since I've been General Secretary since 2010 I have never repudiated, repudiated any action uh, and I'll never repudiate any action so long as the merit in the Health and Safety uh, at Work Act and, and I think this is where government actually have listened to us uh, since March. Um, my one big criticism um, of this government is, and that's got to be the testing. Uh, it's almost as if the track and trace uh, and the testing and then this second wave coming in has taken everybody su by surprise in government. And you've got to ask yourself why, because everybody knew they were warned by scientists, they were warned by the Labour Party, they were warned by the opposition parties that the second wave was coming 
from October onwards, and it's arrived a little bit earlier. And now we see ourselves in a mess with, I mean, they were boasting that we would have a testing facility that was the envy of the world and the best in the world. That was not, and I would rather not boasting about being the best in the world. I just want something that actually works. That would be good for, for the whole of Britain uh, and for everybody in it, because there's a lot of people that are frightened at the moment. There's a lot of people frightened that, uh, who have been furloughed, uh, who have been served redundancy notices because some employers, unfortunately, uh, are using this as a way of actually shedding staff and ripping up terms conditions uh, and issuing fresh terms conditions to individuals that are inferior to what they were on. And history won't be kind uh, to politicians of this country if we aren't effective. And it's the same with trade unions. We've got to be effective. We've got to fight for the individuals that don't have a voice. And I would say to anybody listening, if you're not already in a trade union, join a trade union, the relevant trade union to your industry, because that way you will be protected. And we've got to fight for those, the unemployed, with, that's going to rise. We've got to look at decent housing, decent jobs, de decent health facilities. It matters not to me whether people voted for Brexit or to actually remain. Uh, the most important issue for us is that we, we protect uh, jobs, we protect the health service, we protect um, those that are vulnerable, those that are in precarious workplaces. So, but it's not just them that's been attacked. And I think the only way we can do that is by having uh, cohesive strategies, organising for the future, not just opposing for the sake of opposing, but having clear, coherent strategies that um, absolutely rewrite the narrative. And we control that narrative so that people understand it, so that we're credible uh, going forward. And I think if we do control that narrative, then the nastiness goes away because I'm sick and tired of social media where I see individuals uh, for every time that something goes wrong, it's the fault of refugees, or it's the fault of Muslims, or it's the fault of young people, or it's the fault of old people, or people in our care homes, or even indeed prisoners uh, or ex-offenders in society. And, and I think we've got to get back controlling the narrative. And I know it's very difficult uh, in Britain to do that when you've got effectively um, a media that is very right wing and controlled uh, by the money people and so forth. But we've got to find a way of doing that. And I think once we do that, because sometimes we can control the narrative and when we do it, we do it very, very well. And I think um, it's not just a matter of opposing things for opposing things sake. It's about holding people accountable. And I think the, the reality is why we've not got a grip on the virus is because people um, were adhering to everything everything that has been put forward by government because it was a sensible thing to do having the lockdown and then when Cummings broke that lockdown I think a lot of people uh, threw the towel in and said well if they're not going to hold him to account how can they hold the rest of the country to account um, and I think that was the start of it had they dealt with him appropriately and effectively and swiftly I think um, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. But I think this government uh, think they're not accountable to anybody because they've got an 80 seat majority. And as disappointing as the last election result, I think we will become stronger as time goes on because I think people, even in the red wall areas, uh, they're, they're potentially the ones that are going to suffer the most. And um, I'm afraid people like uh, the Prime Minister, Mr Johnson, and I'll refuse to call him by his first name uh, because he's not a friend. He's not a mate that you can trust to go down the pub with and have a pint. He's not our prime minister. So the reality is, I think we will soon see a situation where we can control the narrative because things will be so bad in this country that we will need that alternative. And that alternative is a strong Labour government and strong trade unions. Thank you.
Yes, Steve. Thank you very much for that. Uh, before, obviously, just before we go into the um, the political speakers that are here with us tonight, there was there's a question that's been put in from uh, Alice Morris. Uh, she says, "Hi, I was so pleased with to see the radical policies that Corbyn and McDonnell put forward in the Labour manifesto. Their economic agenda is transformative and just what the country needs, particularly at this time of crisis." Does the panel think Keir is going to continue with this sort of agenda? Members I've spoken to are worried that he'll go back to a centre-left and new Labour approach. So if you can think about that when, when, you're, when you're making your contribution and if, if it's possible to give that an answer, we'd really appreciate it. Um, it's, it's now my pleasure to, to, um, to, got to, to invite in um, the recently elected uh, Aspana Bergen. Uh, who's the Labour MP for Poplar and Limehouse. I know obviously uh, well, what we would regard as one of the rising stars actually. Uh, we've been watching, watching in Westminster. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce us, Barna, to address the meeting. Thank you so much, Ian, and, and greetings to everybody that's, that's joined us today. Um, I want to sort of, I guess, begin by sort of talking about, yeah, the, the sort of unfairness and injustice and hardship um, that people have facing all over the country uh, because they're being let down by uh, the Tory government's patchy uh, pandemic support measures. Um, and this is, of course, despite people continuing to work hard, whether it's from home, um, in cramped conditions, with limited equipment, um, balancing paid work against caring responsibilities, or essentially forced to work in unsafe conditions without protections um, or, you know, supporting them, uh, supporting others around them um, uh, unpaid. Um, and on top of this, obviously, with the recession now, we've got mass unemployment looming um, in the not-so-distant future, and workers are increasingly being subject to cynical fire and rehire exercises, disgracefully aimed at imposing less favourable conditions. And, you know, over and over again, the Tories have demonstrated a chilling disregard for people suffering, as their economics, uh, economics have trapped too many people in low-paid, insecure work. I and mean, as such, you know, there is a real sense of dissatisfaction, even despair in workplaces across uh, Tory Britain. And even before the pandemic, I mean, workers in this country knew that. They, they knew that despite sort of working longer hours than those in all other EU countries, you know, except recent Austria, millions cannot afford to make ends meet. And there was a recent um, report by the Joseph Rantry um, uh, Foundation at the beginning of the year, which found that um, the proportion of people in work who live in poverty went up for the third consecutive year to a record high. This government has run down our communities and torn away our rights in order to attempt to create a cynical kind of dog-eat-dog -dog world in which only the rich flourish at the hardship of others. And so trade unionism is one of the most fundamental responses to the injustices we face. It's the best way to see your pay increase, to see a safer environment at work, and to feel freer to express your opinion and have your rights realised. Um, but even more crucially, I think it's about signposting towards a better way of life. And, you know, a successful and fair economy can't be created uh, without the full involvement of its workforce. Um, and I want to just, I guess, touch upon, you know, it's been touched upon a bit already in terms of the furlough scheme and, and fire and rehire. So, you know, closing the furlough scheme while the, pan while the pandemic is ongoing obviously risks economic damage, especially to the sectors and communities that have already been har hit hardest by COVID-19. And I believe, you know, as, as do some others that, you know, there is still time for the government to act, to listen to the trade unions and to extend the furlough scheme where it's needed to prevent the effect of, of that mass redundancies could have. Um, but, you know, I'm not holding my breath. Um, in my uh, constituency, my local area, I've continued to stand in solidarity with uh, striking workers at Tower Hamlet's Council, uh, the majority of whom actually are being women. Um, and have been uh, sacked and been asked to sign new contracts with detrimental terms and conditions. Um, and I was sort of, you know, um, humbled to address over 400 people who joined a virtual rally on that on, on um, just early on in July, uh, which was a Zoom crashed by comrade John McDonnell. Um, uh, but see, speaking to uh, constituents on the picket line, it was really clear that, you know, the, the decision to strike was the last resort. 
and the support from the wider labor union movement for their courageous stance um, against this decision continues to grow. And, um, you know, since the fire and rehire tactic has been used um, by a number of employers um, and at the same time condemned, we know that it needs to be outlawed, outlawed uh, no doubt about that at all. Um, and, uh, you know, this has to be as part of a wider strengthening of trade union rights across the board. Um, we we really must continue to struggle for the rights, incomes and, and safety of all our workers, you know, whether that's our postal workers, our doctors, our bus drivers, um, our cleaners, our supermarket shelf stackers, our nurses, um, to our migrant workers and, and carers, uh, which is why, I, you know, I think um, the Dying for Sick uh, campaign led by many of the trade unions here is so important because too many are unable to live on what they currently have. And it's ever more necessary that we address the flaws in our uh, sick pay system and ensure that everyone, everyone is properly supported to be able to isolate um, and protect public health. Um, I want to sort of talk about um, defeating discrimination as well. So, you know, workplace rights also really include celebrating diversity in the workplace and defeating discrimination that many people face because of you know their gender their age religion race ethnicity their, their cultural background disability or their sexual orientation and it's really clear that there are systemic economic inequalities that mean that ethnic minority communities in particular are unfairly disadvantaged by such a health crisis and we know that this comes after years of austerity which has had a devastating impact on ethnic minority communities um, but even now, you know, discrimination and structural racism continue to dictate who gets dumped on and who gets resources, you know, who suffers events worse. And uh, those from ethnic minority backgrounds are more likely to work in jobs that can't be done remotely, obviously increasing their risk of contracting the coronavirus. So, you know, not, not only are we yet to have justice for workers such as Benny Majinga, but many are still being forced to work in unsafe conditions. And um, there was a, a study by the Royal College of Nursing, uh, which, you know, recently even revealed that BME nursing staff experienced the greatest PPE shortages. So it's not, you know, um, I, I guess, you know, just looking at my constituency, for example, I mean, it's, it's not random, for example, that British Bangladeshis are one of the groups most vulnerable to the virus. Uh, we had the annual uh, population survey in 2018, which uh, revealed that Bangladeshi workers are disproportionately employed in distribution, hotels and restaurants and transport and communication. Uh, that includes road transport drivers as well as key workers, um, you know, from sales, sales assistants to retail cashiers. And likewise, you know, those from ethnic minority backgrounds continue to face an unfair uh, pay gap on average, you know, having lower incomes than their white counterparts. Um, in fact, you know, Bangladeshi uh, workers have the uh, lowest uh, median hourly pay of any other ethnic group and are overrepresented in the most deprived neighbourhoods in England. Uh, you know, the very areas where deaths from the coronavirus occur at double the rate uh, than in more affluent areas. Um, and you know, households with a, with a low income are more likely than higher income households to be overcrowded and have damp problems um, you know, because they, they can't afford to move to a larger home or fix those damp problems. And, you know, I've mentioned this before, but, you know, th th that's really relevant because we know COVID-19 attacks the respiratory system um, and that can be compromised by chronic exposure to damp conditions. Um, and on top of all of this, you know, we're seeing how the hostile environment has resulted in many migrants being left destitute and at greater risk of infection. So, you know, th that in intersection between race and class really uh, frames many of our experiences on a day to day basis. And, you know, I think you know, the pandemic has really exposed uh, how the Tories ec economy for the few is not fit for purpose and is you know, fundamentally unfair un and unequal. And, you know, when we look at policies uh, relating to housing, local government, uh, the fire and rescue service, for example, uh, research and, you know, other areas have been sort of really driven by this agenda of cuts, uh, deregulation and privatisation. And that's been sort of really fostered as well by the direct lobbying of private business interests. 
Um, and I want to just take a moment to sort of pay tribute to those who are delivering public and essential services, especially our NHS staff and those on the front line, uh, because it's really clear that you know public services as a whole have been ill prepared for dealing with this kind of large scale uh, health risk um, because you know government's been too busy on you know on seeing overseeing spending cuts um, on a scale not seen for generations and those services have been cut to the bone and in some cases beyond so I really think it's um vital that economic measures are introduced in the interests of the majority of people to ensure those with the broader shoulders of course pay their fair share and it's been really shameful how the government are obviously dragging their heels every step of the way even now regarding the crisis um, you know what could be more important than saving lives and protecting people's dignity in their later years so you know we need to keep uh, we need to therefore really oppose them we need to oppose them every step of the way um, and I'll be there with you always pushing back against um, the attack on our rights against the privatization and marketization of our services um, I'll end on this which is you know Jeremy Corbyn point, uh, pointedly sort of pointed out months and months ago that uh, the COVID-19 crisis is exposing the weakness in our economy and society but it's also showing us how much we are dependent uh, on each other and I too have been inspired by how people have been organising to protect their communities and you know Jeremy's right uh, it's in this spirit that we must go forward together solidarity thank you very much Aspana uh, obviously because I've just noticed the time I'm going to move on very quickly obviously uh, to our next speaker who obviously turned out to be a very good friend to, to teachers and obviously uh, school children um, and obviously somebody um, who highlighted quite a number of pot potential risks uh, for returning children back to school. So obviously it's a pleasure to invite Rebecca Long-Bailey to address the meeting. Oh, thanks very much Ian and it's a pleasure to come after the brilliant speakers that we've already had already and agree with everything that's been said so far. But at the minute, apparently the Cabinet is supposedly meeting to discuss what next measures are required to tackle the pandemic. And it's important and quite alarming, frankly, to note that this meeting has been set against a backdrop of press briefings over the last 24 hours, which saw articles such as one that I saw in the Telegraph, which stated that we couldn't have a second lockdown and that we just needed to learn to live with the virus. Now, I don't think there's anyone who's watching this call who wants a second lockdown. And if the government doesn't want to have a second lockdown, then it's got to take the advice of groups such as the independent SAGE scientists in following their recommendations, some of which uh, point to allowing people who can work from home to actually work from home, making sure that workplaces really are safe when an employee can't work from home, providing support to schools to actually allow distancing to take place and for digital devices to be provided to all children so that when they do have to go home, when there are reported cases of coronavirus, as we've seen skyrocket in the last few weeks, that they can actually learn at home on a laptop and no child is disadvantaged. But it's very worrying at the moment because we're at a critical stage. Salford, where I am, is a city that's on red alert. We're clearly well above the R rate of one and the cases that we're seeing are rising exponentially day on day. The world, beat, the world beating testing system that the government promised us, the Operation Moonshot that apparently Salford was supposed to be at the centre of, well, I mean, over the last few weeks, I've been inundated with calls from parents and workers who haven't been able to access tests. And if you have been lucky enough to get a slot, a lot of the time those slots have been hundreds of miles away in Inverness, in Landudno, and even further afield. And the government told us when they started to ease the lockdown that we needed to get the economy moving. And in order to do this, they'd ensure that we were kept safe by having the COVID secure workplaces and to have this world beating test track and trace system in place. We were told to get back to work, we were told to go to the pub, we were told to send our children to school despite ignoring the calls from teachers unions to have full testing in place before we reopened schools. 
and to have a plan B in the event of outbreaks that were properly planned for blended home and school learning. And now the infection rate inevitably skyrockets and the government bumbles about, we get leaks about potential curfews for pubs to close at 10 p.m. as if COVID has a rest until 10 p.m. and then only decides to go on the rampage. We're told to call the police on your neighbours if you see a, a bigger group than six people, as if Brenda, number 33, is going to ring the police because she's angry that next door is having a barbecue. Now Brenda at number 33, if she'd been burgled, wouldn't get a visit from the police because their funding has been decimated over the last 10 years. Our police services are struggling to respond to a threat to human life, never mind responding to breaches of coronavirus legislation. Now the R rate is above one and we can't ignore the fact that that means that people are going to die and we deserve better than this. Yet we're being convinced ever so gradually that there's a fine balance between protecting the economy and protecting public health and that frankly in the battle of those arguments it's always the economy that has to come out on top and I don't blame people for feeling that that's a choice that they've got to make. Many of these feeling forced to choose between their health or their livelihood. If you feel ill, for example, and you can't get a test, what are you going to do? Risk your job and stay at home or go to work and hope for the best and potentially infect even more people. If you're a parent and you're worried about your child not getting an education or being psychologically detrimented because you haven't seen their friends, what are you going to do? Are you going to keep your child at home and hope for the best and not go to work yourself? Or are you going to send your child to school? risking again that increase in infection rate and then the support that many people were entitled to well as we know we've heard some of the speakers talk about this already furlough is due to come to an end shortly the eviction ban is being lifted and even then the support package that was available it excluded over three million people from self-employed to new starters to businesses who've been struggling over the last six, last six months just to keep their head above water but what I'd say to everyone on this call is that this trade-off between the economy and health, it's not a choice that we should ever be forced to make. And we've got to see stronger action to protect us. And that needs to be put in place urgently. Now, we're not there to serve the economy. The economy is there to serve us. So all of our policy making now, within the party and within the movement, in my view, it needs to revolve around the economic plan that we need to put in place to provide the support that people need now in order to stay safe and to rebuild the economy afterwards and, and also finance the support that we need now. And the stimulus packages that we need to see for this, they were there already. We needed a Green New Deal, a Green Industrial Revolution, if you like. We knew the immense financial power that such a package provided even Goldman Sachs estimated that globally there was $16 trillion to be made if we really harnessed the power of low carbon and renewable energy and technology. And we had a report, as many people know, commissioned before um, the last general election in terms of what the Labour Party's plans were going to be in decarbonising the economy. And on energy alone, for every one pound we invested, we would see three pounds go back into our economy in our, uh, and into our local communities. It estimated providing 850,000 new jobs, 800 billion across the UK by 2030. And overall, across the whole economy, that fiscal stimulus, if you like, that investment package, would have increased wages across the board by 2% by supporting manufacturing and industries in regions that frankly have been deindustrialized over many, many decades. So I'd close my comments in saying that that's just one element of the package that we can put forward. We can look at other sectors, digital, health, pharmaceuticals, a whole range of areas where we can provide that extra push so that we become world leaders in certain sectors and provide the support that people need now so that they feel reassured they can stay at home and the economy isn't gonna fall off the edge of a cliff in the future. It never had to be a trade-off between health in the economy. It should always have been about health. And our movement has to outline now that the policies that we will make show that prioritising the economy over health is a false choice. Now you wouldn't go 
to the family of a nan who died in a care home and say, oh, the sacrifice was worth it, we kept the economy moving. You want to say it to the family of a nurse who'd been looking after our loved ones who died as a result of catching COVID-19. Oh, well, thanks for your service, but we managed to keep the economy going. And you wouldn't say it to the family of a teacher who went in at the times when our economy was shut down and they put their own lives at risk to keep our essential services going. You wouldn't say to them, thanks for your sacrifice, but it was inevitable that this was going to happen. The only choice that we should make as a party and a movement is the welfare of our people and the protection of our people. And that's why I hope over the next six to 12 months, the party engages in, we develop those policies that show that the people come first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Becky. And, and like I say, we, we thank you for the opposition you put up uh, while you were the Shadow Education Minister. Um, obviously, we wish you well um, going forward too. And obviously, I think in, in times to come, people will say, actually, Becky was absolutely right on, on, on education and right about um, the issues that you raised around returning children back to school. Uh, it's now a great pleasure, and obviously needs no introduction at all whatsoever, to, to, to invite John McDonald to the to meeting. Thanks, thanks Ian. Uh, I'll be brief and just sum up, because it, uh, it's been terrific. I tell you, I, I get reassured every time I listen to Becky and Apsana, and yesterday I was um, I chaired a fringe meeting with Ian Byrne and Nadia Witter and Apsana, week before Zara Sultat. This new generation of MPs that have come into Parliament over the last couple of elections just, uh, just gives hope, absolute hope for the future, and it's really inspiring. Um, the question that was put up that you mentioned was about whether Keir will hold to the policies of the last couple of manifestos. Well, that's up to us. <laughs> We're a democratic movement and party, so we have to make sure that we engage in a proper discussion and debate within our party and our movement overall, and make sure that we're developing these policies and we maintain that, that momentum around them. And I think we can do that. I, I think we can do that in a, a comradely debate that goes on. That's the point that Steve made, is well, not just the Labour Party, it's the whole of the trade union movement and all the other social movements that are now have emerged that we're trying to ensure that we work with. And actually in the Bakers Union, you've been inspirational around this, the way in which you've brought people into the trade union movement, but the way you've worked with others as well, whether it's the Renters Union or ACORN or whatever, that's the, that's the way forward, to be honest. Uh, look, very briefly, the issue is this, we stand on the edge of possibly the worst economic recession since the 1930s. And it's made worse, of course it's caused by the pandemic, but two things have made it worse. One is 10 years of austerity because our economy was scraping along the bottom before the pandemic hit. Productivity crisis, lack of investment, wages frozen effectively and since before the 2000-2008 banking crash. Then made worse by the grotesque level of incompetence You've said it, Ian, Steve has said it, uh, and Apsana, and Chama. The incompetence of this government has made it so much worse. Only a month ago, I was desperately struggling to try and get PPE still into my care home locally. Same with testing. And in the hospital, tragically, we've lost the lives. One of our matrons at Hillingdon Hospital died. And all I, I believe there's been criminal negligence by this government at times in the way that they've behaved. And we should hold them to account, and Becky's right at that. Two rights, spot on. But interesting as well, isn't it, that it isn't just the government at the moment that we should be holding to account. You mentioned it, in The nature of some of the, and Apsana did too, the nature of the abuse by some of our employers as well has taken place. You know, a number of them, take it in my constituency, British Airways, Heathrow Limited. Their view is don't let a crisis go to waste. This is the best opportunity they've had to cut wages and undermine terms and conditions of employment that they've been planning for years. And that's what they've done. Hire, you know, fire and rehire, but only on the basis of you'll agree a wages cut and we'll turn up some of the terms and conditions that you've negotiated, well, in my patch, over generations. So let's be realistic about where we're at on the edge of a recession caused by the pandemic. 
But beforehand, the economy was already in a pretty dire straits. In addition to that, the incompetence of the government has made it worse. And Becky's right. It isn't a choice between health and the economy. Both go together. You're not going to have a strong economy unless we're protecting people's health. It's as simple as that. It's interesting, though, isn't it? Um, when you're in a crisis like this, government are more powerful than ever. They have real power to change things and manage things. And what they've done, I'll just give the example. I think you made the point. If you're giving financial support to companies, unconditionally, you lose all power to influence. And that's what's happened. And what we said from the beginning, in all the representations we made to Sunak and Johnson, we made it clear any assistance should be conditional because on that basis, you can prevent them abusing the system. You can prevent us being ripped off. You can prevent them attacking workers and undermining conditions. And you can force them to come to the table to do what Sean has asked for, develop a strategy for each sector of our economy for the long term, not just short term profiteering. What they've done is they've taken government money and they've used it to implement their plans for cutting wages and undermining conditions, but they've also used it to prop up profits as well. You know, there aren't many shareholders or banks that have had a haircut this time, you know, where, you know, as we did in the banking crash, Gordon Brown did impose haircuts on some of the financial houses to make them actually contribute as well. That hasn't happened this time round. So what we're saying, and I agree with Steve, we've got to mobilise the whole movement, is actually saying use that power, put the pressure on government to use that power. Get Keir being the voice of that in terms of the Labour Party, getting the TUC being the voice of it in terms of the TUC, but also getting social movements on a common agenda as well. And it's two things, isn't it? One is exactly as Becky said, start investing for the long term. When the economy is in a situation like this, interest rate cuts aren't going to work. They're already so low. So what you do is you use fiscal stimulus. And the way you do that is you confront the crisis that's coming so rapidly upon us, exactly as Becky developed those policies in terms of the Green New Deal, that you invest on a massive scale on alternative energy sources to overcome our dependence on fossil fuels. And in that way, you create the jobs and you also make sure that our planet survives. But also what you've got to do is that in each sectoral strategy that you develop, you lay down some conditions and those conditions are about how you treat the workforce. The Institute of Employment Rights, John Hendy and CAD and the others and Professor Keith Ewing, they've done a fantastic piece of work. They produced a lot of the manifesto that we had in terms of employment rights before and it's moved on since then, you know. And what is what very simply, Becky and I were talking about this at another meeting last week. Very simply, there's a program for employment rights, aren't there? One is sectoral collective bargaining, so that we actually develop now a sector by sector strategy that's linked upon decent wages. Second, yes, it is the restoration of all trade union rights. And I say it because I think it's important. It's important that we establish trade union rights for everyone. And that includes prison officers as well, Steve, because that is an abuse, a human rights abuse that has taken place that new Labour should have addressed and didn't. The third thing was end all insecure work scrap the zero hour contracts, make sure we have one status of work and make sure that actually exactly as Becky said, we, and Apsana said, we aim for all employment. The third thing as well is the point that you've been campaigning on here, which I completely support you on, you boost the minimum wage. I think we do just need to go to 15 pounds an hour now. Now is the time. We argued last December, 10 pounds an hour and move it on. I think now to stimulate the economy overall, 15 pounds an hour is the right thing to do. And if that means further support to businesses as they get over the hump of the, the pandemic, so much the better. In addition to that, I want to extend it beyond just earnings and have a minimum income guarantee. You know, uh, New Economics Foundation have been arguing for this, and so have a number of others. Resolution Foundation put forward their ideas. I think it's an idea that's come. It's, it's almost a UBU, universal basic income. It's not but as close to it as we can get. And I think that will ensure if you are sick, if you have got a disability, if you can't work, you've also got a decent income that you can live off as well. All of these are pra pragmatic solutions to our crisis at the moment. But from the Labour Party and from the trade union movement and from all progressives, what we should be arguing for, these are solutions for now, but they lay the foundations for the society that we want to create for the future. I think that's inspirational. 
what people need now, you know, when, when you're in this stage and it's, the pandemic is dragging on, the vaccine hasn't been found yet, and, you know, morale can start sinking, this is the time when you give them hope. You say, no matter how difficult it is at the moment, there's a way through this. Here's a strategy that we can pursue, and actually here's the leadership that we can provide from our movement to enable that to happen. I think that's what we need to do. Final point, really. Um, the TUCG, the Trade Union Coordinating Group, was set up to bring together um, the progressive unions so we could coordinate development of ideas, dialogue in terms of the trade union movement, but also that we could coordinate campaigning and action. And I think the TUCG has a key role to play now, both in terms of working with the unions that are members of it to develop the, that strategy, but also driving it forward, exactly as Steve and others have said, within the TUC itself. So I, I'm grateful for the TUCG, one, for the work that it does, for convening this meeting tonight, but also to recognize just how significant an organization it could be in this coming period. And I tell you from Apsana, myself and Becky, uh, um, from the parliamentary view, if you like, you'll have our 100% support in whatever strategies you're now developing, the campaigns that you're waging, and also, if necessary, whatever action needs to be taken to back up what I think is the only way through now. Thank you very much, John, and thank you to all of our speakers for the contributions this evening. Obviously, uh, I hope you found that um, refreshing, invigorating, because I know a lot of people um, have felt um, isolated during, during this crisis, have felt that um, their voices are going to be uh, unheard, uh, that people won't be taking up their arguments, won't be taking up their fight, their fight. but I hope at tonight's TUCG, uh, you will see that the, the fire has not gone out. You know, the fire is still burning. You know, we are still able to, to, to come together as, as a movement. And obviously the TUCG uh, intends to raise its game in, in that area. I mean, the TUCG, if anybody looks at its history, will you, you will see uh, that the TUCG has been at the forefront of many a, many a campaign, whether it was £10 an hour, whether it's been about abolition the... Uh, youth uh, minimum wage, whether it's been about abolition of zero hour contracts, uh, fighting against the trade union legislation. The TUCG uh, has coordinated action um, and will continue to do so. So thank you very much for attending tonight. Uh, thank you to all our speakers for contributions. We look forward hopefully to seeing you in person soon and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>